Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, longtime drummer for the legendary country pop band Lone Star, Keach Rainwater. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, friends out in podcast land? Yep, you are right. It's another exciting time. It's an exciting episode of the Rich Redmond Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, <laughs> and success. Uh, yeah, we do talk a lot. Yeah, see this guy? He's ready to... We, we actually had a converse, uh, conversation together a few days ago because I'm on this gentleman's podcast. And since 1992, he has been a founding member of the highly acclaimed country pop band lone star our friend keach rainwater what's up man let me correct you just a little bit now i wasn't the founding member dean our keyboard player dean he's the founding member he put the whole band together i didn't join until 94 oh so they had a couple of drummers before me there was like a pete best of of lone yeah. star somewhere you know but pete i mean best, the when I when I think of Lone Star, I'm thinking of you, man. I mean, where are these guys? Come on, I mean, you're you're almost at 30 years, and well, you're celebrated 40 years of being a professional drummer, which is a major major yeah. accomplishment, and you're coming up on 30 years as a member of Lone Star, and that's why it's so you know great. It's such a gift to have you today because I know the audience wants to hear about what it's like to be with a group of guys that long riding down the highway in a steel tube and sleeping on airport floors in the early days and building something and make some, making something happen. It's really rarefied air to be in a band for that long. Yeah, it has been uh, now. And I'm sure there are probably some rock bands out there and bands that have been together for 30 years that don't have the same story. Like they kind of hate each other. Or some, <laughs> I've heard stories right. that they can't even be in the same bus together and that kind of thing. That's not like us. We're, in every sense of the word, we're like brothers, we're friends, we're business partners. We, uh, our friendship together, Michael and Dean and myself, and even Drew, our singer, has been on for decades and decades and outlasted other things like marriages and and uh, and, and children growing up and that kind of yeah. thing. And we're still doing what we do and still digging each other, you know. Oh, I love that. I always say, you know, when I do my little speeches, I'm like, hey, you know, we got a group of guys in our band that finish each other's sentences. And it's like this special high level of communication, almost like Aquaman and the fish, you know, like, doo -doo -doo -doo. like it's like unspoken language, you know, a shorthand that only comes from being around guys like literally more than our blood relatives and our family, you know, yeah, that's true. It is very true. You kind of develop a, a, your own language, as it were. You know, I'll give you an example when we had the song Amazed out. And now there was a bunch of remixes of Amazed. Like there was a pop mix yeah. and there was an acoustic mix and there was like all this stuff. And there was a European mix that they did over in the UK that a guy a producer came and added keyboard to it. So we were trying to work up a live version of Amazed. And so there's a part in the song that kind of sounds a little bit like Lionel Richie's uh, um, like, hey, you, you know, that kind oh, of yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. thing. And he goes, dun, dun. So I remember the conversation as being some. Now, when I say European, that means like the European mix of Amazed yeah. had a certain keyboard thing to it. And then, of course, the Lionel Richie part that goes dong, dong. So the conversation was something like, all right, we're going to do this intro for this TV show. OK, so let's do two Europeans and one Lionel Richie and then we're in. And I just stopped and thought, who else would even understand what that means? You know? Exactly. Exactly. So, so tell us, you know, now your roots are originally, you're a Texas boy, right? Originally from Plano, right. Texas. Mm -hmm. I mean, Texas. anybody who's been to Plano, Texas, like, wow, that is a, a very nice area. Frisco, Texas, Addison, Texas. You used to call it like an adult playground because there's just so many like comedy clubs and dance clubs and live music venues and killer steak houses. And like, I did a lot of playing in Addison. So Plano, Texas, um, that must have been really like when it was first being developed uh, back then as a new development. It was. Yeah. As a matter of fact, where I, where we lived in our little neighborhood across the Creek was all fields and farms and things like that. As a matter of fact, when I was a kid, we came back from the movie theater and there was a cow in our front yard, just standing in our front yard. He had, <laughs> he had crossed the Creek from the farms over there and then just kind of got, you know, in our front yard. Oh and then God. that became houses and that developed. And then our uh, elementary school was actually brand new at the time. We could still smell paint and it was all new, all that stuff. And now of course it's all grown up and, you know, sound like yeah. an old man. Oh yeah. Get but, off my lawn. But uh, you know, it is, uh, it's, 
it, Texas is special because, you know, the music education culture there is fantastic. The support for the arts. There's a lot of live music, very rich culture, uh, melting pot. Um, and you when did you start, you know, get the drum bug and do that thing? How did that all begin? OK, so when I was young, I kind of knew how to play drums. I, it's, you know how it is. I mean, yeah. not a lot of people don't understand this. I found out later that a lot of people don't just sit down at a drum kit and know how to play stuff. I just kind of did. I knew where the hi-hat was and I knew kind of how to play. And I was actually shocked when I would hear other drummers fumble with something simple like honky-tonk women. Boom, yeah. bop. Boom, bop, boom, boom, bop. And I'm like, you can't play that. I thought everybody could. I just kind of <laughs> had a natural thing to it. And so I played trumpet for a little while because they said they already had enough drummers and that kind of thing. So one day I was coming from the band room with my trumpet in the case. And there was a group of guys from band, like a trom trumpet trombone players and a, a clarinet player or something like that. But they were playing guitars and bass and drums. And they were playing, they were working up for the talent show practicing um wildfire by michael murphy oh yeah and i sat and i watched this band rehearse as a band you know not like with a band director saying okay let's start the song and count it off whatever um i was already used to that watching a group of guys talk amongst themselves within the band say like, wait and stop the song and go let's fix that one part or let's start okay start it again and play it this way and they would kind of cross pollinate each other's parts that turned me on. That made me, I just looked up there and saw that drummer counting off the song and playing it. And then st and I thought that's, that is what I want to do right there. That was my epiphany. And yes. I haven't kind of haven't stopped since then, you know, that's your, that's your, that's your change of life moment. What? how old were you, you know, then? What grade were you? 13. Okay. I was 13 years old in seventh grade. Nice. All Second the changes. Year of trumpet. Yeah. yeah. Second year of trumpet. I was getting pretty good at trumpet. Uh, but at that point, my focus changed. I went from one, you know, being a pretty good trumpet player to I still did that and I still practiced and still did my due diligence in the practicing. But secretly, I knew I already I was going to be a drummer. It didn't matter what kind of music it was going to be like rock or country or jazz or whatever. I just knew that, you know, I was going to be a drummer. Well, that probably helped you uh, playing uh, trumpet uh, as far as like scales tonal patterns, hearing melodies, hearing phrases, being able to read music. It's probably a good foundation. You yeah. still have the trumpet in the case somewhere? I do. I have yeah. <laughs> uh, three of them now. I have, nice. well, three different horns. I have a mellophone, which is kind of like a marching French horn. It's actually oh, like a, totally. a French horn that you play like a cornet, like a trumpet with a big bell about this big. Um, and they sound like a French horn. It's amazing. Um, and I have a flugelhorn like Chuck Mangione used oh, yeah. to play, you know, like yes. it feels so good. Oh, God, um, and I have a trumpet. So I have those hanging in my another music room in my house. I dated so many mellophone players in high school. I don't know what it was, you know, because because in the concert band, the percussion section is right by the French horns and then in the marching band you know there there's always like you know you're playing your snare drum and then there's all these different you know sections of the marching band are in front of you and and I would somehow manage to flirt even when we were playing uh, music I don't know um, those girls look so good in those marching uniforms right <laughs> right and the, the flag the, I mean, girls and the rifle girls I, little blue the ours were blue blue uh uniform pants or whatever they were slacks I mean I you could I mean, how could you not love a girl in a uniform like that? That's great. Right, right, right. So, so um, where to pre Lone Star, which is the original name of the band was Texas C or Tex Texas. Like yeah. yeah. <laughs> if like exactly. Texas and Tennessee swiped right, that That's was right. That's Texas exactly C. why we changed the name. Yeah. <laughs> Because nobody knew how to pronounce it. You know, right. it was kind of like a problem, you know. So, did you Texas guys start as like a Tennessee? I'm sorry. Did you guys start as like, a, like, were you in uh, covers with originals or did you go right to the original lane? Started out, they started out before I joined, they had a couple other drummers as Texas C um, that they would just play copy music at first. They were just trying to work, you know, and then slowly because, I mean, you got these great writers in there. You got Richie and Dean and Michael and John Rich was, John Rich the band was playing John slapping Rich the bass was, in the band at the time, yeah, right? Right out of high school, literally right out of wow. high school. Um, he worked at Opryland for just a short time and met Dean there and Dean knew he could play bass. And so he said, um, Hey, why don't you come play bass with us? And John said, well, um, I kind of know how to play a bass. So we even bought a bass and didn't really know how to play it. So every time that we would rehearse, they would rehearse a, a new song. They would tell John who kind of knew how to play guitar a little bit, but really not so much bass. Um, they said, uh, he, John would say, what key is the song in? And he'd go uh, D and he'd go play a D. And they would play a D and here we go. Boom. Okay. I'm good. And then he would know how to play the song. 
<laughs> oh my god so he just had to yeah he had to find his tonal center on the neck and then fine off. where where's that note and then once he found the note he was good to i uh, go okay i got it wow so yeah so john rich uh, all those writers in the band what they were born to write i mean it's got so much material built pent up inside them um yeah. they started writing as a band as a group and by themselves and they started throwing songs out there and they started kind of recording some demos you know the typical 90s you know you go in the studio and you uh, pay somebody 150 bucks or something and you got the whole three hour block to record as many songs as you can right, right. you know and uh, they started pitching it around and things like that and didn't really get anywhere mainly because there were two well there were multiple singers in the band that was everybody sang so they decided to focus down on two singers richie and John Rich the, as the two vocalists. That was even still a problem because a lot of labels, they go, no, you just got to have one singer. And we're our, in our defense, we were like, well, you mean like the Eagles or the Beatles or Hello. all those other bands that have multiple singers? I mean, that, that yeah. doesn't work. And then they were their answer was, well, in, in our country genre, in the industry, the way it is right now with radio, um, we really have to focus on like one singer kind of thing. Yeah. But eventually RCA or BNA, you know, which is part of RCA, they signed us with that bravado that, you know, okay, you can have two lead singers. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's just so cool to be for you guys to be in a band marketed as a band. You're all, you know, uh, you know, you go to your video shoots and your photo shoots and there's a stylist there and a wardrobe gal and you're all in all the photos, one for all, all for one. It's a great, great thing. And to do it for 30 years is just incredible. So what year is it that you moved to Nashville and tell us about the difference between then Nashville and now Nashville. Okay. Okay. So I joined, I was one of the few fortunate guys that moved to Nashville with a gig with this Texas C, my friend, Michael, that played, plays guitar with us. Sure. He uh, was a guitar player back. He was the guitar player back then that kind of uh, also a founding member. He was the very first, like when he, he was the first person Dean besides Richie, but, but that he called to be in the band. And so Michael knew me, we would played in Canyon together for the group Canyon for a year and a half. And uh, so he called me and said, Hey, we've got a couple of drummers that we've had and that have just not worked out. Um, and our drummer now wants to go join Ken Mellons. I don't know if you remember who Ken I Mellons remember was. I remember Ken, yeah. Because um, his thing was, the drummer was um, Mike uh, Mike Tucker was his name. I know he Mike said, Tucker, well, yeah. Wanna, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Michael, Mike Tucker said, well, I, I like being in this band and it's all good, but I've got an offer to be on a tour bus, you know, and like being a band with a record deal and a tour bus. And he just wanted to go to the bus, be on a bus instead of a van and trailer. Oh yeah. And so, you know, I can understand that totally. And so he, they called me and I said, yeah, I've been thinking about coming to Nashville. I'm not quite sure yet, but let me come up there and just, we'll listen to each other. I'll, you listen to me. And I had already had a pretty good reputation at the time at, as the drummer for Canyon all those years. And I'd already done the whole record deal and the whole fanfare and the radio tours and all the, we'd done eight videos, eight music videos in Canyon. Yeah. And so I'd already kind of done all that when those guys uh, Richie and Michael and Dean and John and all them, they hadn't experienced that yet. They were, they were still yet to understand what it was like to go into a radio station at nine o'clock in the morning. And with the understanding that you're not going to sing because it's early in the morning and then saying, Oh, you're going to sing for us. Right. <laughs> you know, all that stuff. Oh they yeah. Had, we all, you know, I, I warned them all that what it would be like. Yeah. Um, so I had that experience and everything and was able to come in with a gig to Nashville in 1994. They said, you know, if you want to, join our band. You got the gig. You're good. And then I kind of had one little thing that I wanted to add to that, the deal. And it was, um, they had been told by some management people, don't let your drummer be part of the ownership of the band. You don't have to do that. Now, who you told can you hire that? a drummer. Uh, well, the uh, management people that the guys were working with at the time, they were, right. they had a man, they had a couple guys that were trying to shop a deal and that kind of thing. And they were trying to set up the whole thing in the beginning. And they said, you don't have to make your drummer a part of the deal because, you know, drummers come and go, obviously. Um, but the guys, to their credit, they said, well, we like this drummer. He um, I, he's one of us. He's a good fit. And uh, so I told them, I said, if I come to Nashville, I would definitely have to be a part of the ownership of the band. I'm, I mean, I don't want to move here and do all that stuff and set up shop and right. be the drummer. And if it's because in Canyon, I wasn't, I was just a hired guy, even though I'm on all the album covers yeah. and on all the, all the fanfare, a lot of free stuff we had to do. We were expected to be like a member of the band, but we were, you know, in actuality, we were just paid so, right. like side guys, you know, yeah. just made a little small. A lot of people don't know salary. that, but I mean, I already love this story because it's, 
it's it, it's so common and it's like you were looking to take that next step and to have ownership in something special and you kind of drew your line in the sand and said this is what's got to happen and the guys liked your you personally and professionally enough to stick their necks out and go no this is happening he is in yep. our business model they did they stuck their neck and they actually told the management people no we like this guy we want to they because they fought him on it they fought him on it they said we this guy is our friend and we know him and michael's worked with him before he's a good we think he's the perfect fit for us and that kind of thing um and i just told them i said look after six months if everything when i first joined after six months if everything's hunky-dory and it's all good uh make you make me a member and if we're happy with each other, it's all good. If in six months you don't like me or it's not working out or I end up being a jerk or something, then I totally understand. And so the, I think it was about eight months had gone by. And I finally, I went to Dean and the guys and I said, are we, are we good? And they, they said, oh yeah, yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're good. And so about a month later, we got a record deal. <laughs> that is amazing. So it was all perfect timing. The lawyer comes in, signs everything, boom, mm -hmm. you're in the band, full deal. You're on all the covers. Incredible. I love that story. And there's a lot of folks out there that, you know, aren't necessarily, that, you know, listeners of this show, uh, especially that are not musicians. We've got some non-musicians that enjoy this show. And so for them to kind of like understand how that works, it's all about business models and paper and putting pen to paper and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, that worked out fantastic for you. And I'm sure it affected your quality of life. And not only that, but just the morale in the band, you know, where everybody yeah, feels right. like they're part of something super special. Yeah, being part of a project like that, being have, having part ownership and something yeah. like that, you, I think it affects your playing, it affects your look, it affects your, uh, your living situation. You just kind of, uh, you, I think you kind of tend to live a cleaner life. I want to say because you have, you're responsible for so much. Oh yeah, being a member of the band and to kind of keep your nose clean and that kind of thing. Oh yeah, he'll say, um, oh man, we so got we, we got a photo shoot in January, and so I really got to watch my uh, Christmas calories. You know, I mean, and there's right. always a photo shoot, there's always a video. It keeps you on your toes. Um, well, right. that's great. And so, like, who were the uh, drummers, say, in your early days that were kind of influencing your playing at the time and going into Canyon, going into Lone Star? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I was when I was in high school, I was playing in a little garage rock band, and some of the guys were saying, "Hey, have you heard Pat Travers? This we got this album. Want you listen to Pat Travers? It's got a guy on there named Tommy Aldrich, who's oh, like yeah. a really great double bass drummer and all that. Never heard of his name before. Never heard." And so they played me this album, uh, Go For What You Know, Pat Travers Live, 1978 was recorded all on a bunch of live recordings. And it blew me away. I wanted to be, I wanted, I didn't want to be like him. I wanted to be him. Oh, yeah. And uh, anyway, so um, it was amazing. And um, to hear his story is amazing, too, how he was kind of held back by his stepdad and he wasn't allowed to practice and set for just this much a day. Yeah. And then you can imagine. Imagine it's like setting a thoroughbred free. All of a sudden, he's out of high school. He's on his own. He can practice all he wants to. And he just went crazy, practiced all the time and became the drummer that he is. Anyway, so Tommy Aldridge. And then I heard of a guy named Vinny Kaliuta. Okay. That was playing on Gino Vanelli record. I oh, was come dating on. a girl yeah. and she put this cassette tape in. This is how long, far back we're going. Yeah. She put a cassette tape in and it was um, two albums by Gino Vanelli, um, Brother to Brother and... Um, um, not Nightwalker. Yes. And the Nightwalker album had this drummer. I could tell it was a different one than Mark Craney on the album before, the Brother to Brother album, who Mark Craney was a great influence. Oh, too. man, we lost him too early, this. man. I know, it's true. And I actually got to meet Vinny Caliuta uh, last year, well, right before COVID hit. We were doing this project for wounded soldiers, families, and that kind of thing. And Vinny Caliuta was in the studio playing on something that Richie had written. And uh, I got to meet him and talk to him and everything. And that was like a dream come true. So was yeah, it, I, isn't it bad when you're, you know, some of you meet your heroes and, and they let you down. You're like, Oh, he was a jerk, but everything worked out. Don't ever was, meet your heroes. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Did you get to meet Tommy ever? Tommy Aldrich? Not, I have not. No. Not I bet, yet, if, but I I bet if you reached out somehow, somehow you're like, Hey man, you're, you know, I mean, look at, I, you know, I've been in this band for 30 years and you were lit the spark. You were the spark plug. That's right. I bet he would. He he really is a nice guy. He really is a genuinely nice guy. Yeah, I've I've heard and I've and I can see it. You know, he doesn't age. But he looks exactly the same as he did forty years ago. No, right? And he does the same solo that he's been doing since nineteen seventy five or something. You I know. know it's like, well, he's like he figured and, out. Yeah, he figured out the crowd yeah. pleaser. It's like I'm going to start with my hands. I'm going to pick up the sticks. Yeah. There's going to be crowd. Uh, you know, I love when there's drum solos and there's like crowd incorporation. Like boom, oh, boom, yeah. God. Boom, boom, ka, ka, yeah. boom, boom. Ka, oh, that's right. That whole, that. You know, that whole <laughs> thing. And then before you go up, two in the hand, two in the feet, and the train is rolling down yeah. the tracks. 
Yeah, that's awesome. And he did that like five stroke roll thing that one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. That's, <laughs> that's really difficult. And I used to play double bass back in the day, you know, when I was first starting out, I was in a couple of rock bands in the early, mid eighties and um, I played double bass and all that. But I found out one interesting fact about double bass that a lot of people don't realize when they start you know, like touring and that kind of thing is that you add in an extra bass drum. Okay. Let's, let's just, let's just think about this. You have to add another head. You got to buy for the drum. You got another kick pedal you have to keep up with. Right. Yep. Sometimes it's even hard to keep up with one. Right. Yeah. I have a spare and all that. So now yeah, you have a spare another for two pedal, drums. Yeah. 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 A spare for the pet for the yeah spare. And then or a, uh, another pedal you got to keep up with. You got a microphone you got to put in there and a cord, another stand, another channel on the board, another case, Big giant case you have to put the drum in. It just goes on and on and right. on, all the implications. Totally. Just to have, so you can go. Doodle, 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 doodle. Yeah, and the front of house guys so like, come on, that. really? So the double bass pedal is worth its weight in gold. And I've yeah. always had one as part of my thing since like 1984. And people were like, yeah, that just sits up there and collects dust. I'm like, hey, man, it's there. If at the end of a song and we have like a little trash can ending and I want to go, how do how do how do how do it's there, right? I mean, but it's a, fir- yeah. it's a surefire way to get. Get fired if you do it in a way that is unmusical. It's in an inappropriate situation. Um, and my double bass chops are like, um, probably like yours because we're similar age, but like Carmine Apathy, like the falling rocks kind of thing, you know, that whole stuff. And then um, just the, you know, or that all that kind of stuff, you know. But if you want to see like someone like really take it to high art and just depress you, it's like a guy like Thomas Lang who's like back. Stage, he's warming up. He's doing the exact same thing with his hands that he's doing with his feet. You know, like oh, that crazy. It's like, come on, man. Do you have a social life? Do you yeah. get? And he does. I mean, he, these guys have balanced lives, but I don't know. There's just, I think, like every twenty years, some um, technical freak comes along. You know, yeah, right. That, that and uh, um, Travis Barker, if you ever watch him, that oh, guy sure. is insane. He rehearses. I heard a story. Tell me if you've heard the same thing. Is it true? He practices sometimes eight hours a day. Sure. Eight hours a day on drum on drums. I could barely do an hour and a half show. I well, mean, now I'm that he's a Kardashian, he doesn't have to worry about anything, man. He's driving a faster car to a bigger <laughs> house and then to another faster car and a shiny. I mean, drum look set. at his physique. I mean, he weighs what a hundred pounds, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, totally, totally. But I, I see what he practices on backstage. He has like that practice kit, you know. Oh, and he'll yeah. do like Right, his right foot and his right hand, a little, and then his right foot and his left hand, a little, yeah. and he just changes it up. And oh my god, great drummer! Yeah, for sure. So those were the guys, um, Tommy yep. and um, Vinny. Tommy, Vinny yeah. Well, Vinny is just such a also amazing technique, amazingly musical, and then just takes lots of chances. And no one sounds like him. Just so unique. Yeah, anyway, and I did not know anything about Hal Blaine at the time. No. Didn't even know who his, what his name was or Paul Lime or anything like that. These names would crop up later Yeah, when you start talking about playing in the studio, you start talking to producers and make, making records and the behind the scenes kind of thing. Then you learn who Paul Lime and, and, uh, and Hal Blaine and those guys are kind of best kept secrets, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. They have their studio tans, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so and you sign the record deal. Lovely. What is that like, mm-hmm. Keith? What is it? You sign the record deal, and then what happens in Nashville? You know, where it's it's the songwriting capital of the world. So now the band's being pitched some great songs by high level songwriters, and you guys got to kind of like kind of pick the best songs that are going to work together as a ten song collection, and then you got to go about and pick the single. What was the first single with Lone Star? It was called Tequila Talking. That's right. And okay. I just listened to it today it on the treadmill. Just tequila talking. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, really? And, really? Uh, so that song, yeah. yeah, that song came out and uh, nobody kind of knew who we were. You know, it was one of those things that the DJs would play it because they were, you know, the promoter, the record promoters would go in and talk them into playing this new song from a band called Lone Star. You know, big deal. We don't know who they are. Well, okay, we'll play it. So they play it with no back sale or anything. So it'd be like in a block of like Brooks and Dunn, Randy Travis, and it'd be like, us for a minute and then it would be somebody else and then on a big block and no one would say our name they would say they would just hear the song so then when we went out to tour we had which by the way we had to quit our day job as it were our our bar gigs we had a manager at the time bill carter that said you cannot be a recording artist and a bar band at the same time you have to decide one or the other so we had to cancel all of our dance club bar gigs that we had you know and 
and book shows that were just us, all of our songs, all of our one, one hour, one and a half hour show. And then we would one night stands and we would do like a show and the next day, that kind of thing. Yeah. And we would play some songs on our album, which nobody would heard. Then all of a sudden we'd get to tequila talking and people would go, uh, wait, I've heard that song. You know, it's one of those things that that's you guys. So that then, the, of course, no news was the second release. Okay. In 96 was the second, uh, in, and it went to number one for two weeks in a row, two weeks in a row. Nice. It was a number one. So that one, that one kind of put us on the map where people yeah. kind of knew our name. We had a video for it and everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was kind of looking through Spotify. This is where we are. I've totally drank the Kool-Aid uh, like a young person. <laughs> I got rid of all my CDs, all of my cassettes. The cassettes were melting. The CDs, like, I don't have a CD player. So now I'm a total uh, Spotify guy. But um, mm. I know you guys have charted more than 20 singles. You have at least seven albums. I mean, some of these songs might ring a bell. You mentioned No News, Come Crying to Me, Amaze. That was a big one, like the official wedding song of that year. Smile, What About Now, Tell Her I'm Already There, My Front Porch Looking In. When you, now, when you guys have this body of work, you guys are going out to, to play shows year after year, these 30 years. Are you, I, you know, I know with us, it's like you kind of like for this genre, uh, country pop, country rock, um, the, the fans, they just like to hear that, what they hear on the radio. Like, don't extend the guitar solo too long. Don't stick a drum solo in the middle of tequila talking. Like, just play yeah. the song. So it seems like year after year, we might change the order of the songs and there might be an interesting intro or an outro. But do you guys get together every year and go like, all right, let's change up this order. Let's let's drop that. It's weird as you get more, more and more number one songs. We're going to drop that one because it's just not holding up anymore. So do you guys do that, get together once a year and kind of like, put a new show together we do yeah absolutely yeah. we do all that we uh we try to keep so kind of the way we go about it is is our songs the sonically the way we play them we try to uh accurately reproduce the record so we want to sound like ourselves we want to sound like the record but uh and a, a caveat to that is that we may take something like no news and do a little break in the middle and play get back by the beatles because it's kind of the same in the same key and all that stuff. And so we do this kind of little get back thing and we go right back into no news. So it's kind of like a showy thing that we do. Yeah. But um, what was I going to say? It's uh, a little, so, little Vegas in there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Just kind of just to give them a little something more to listen to you just for fun. Yeah. But the sonically, we try to we don't change up too much as far as the way the song sounds, you know, um, we try to make it sound like the record because we know that's what they want. You know, they want to hear something familiar. Um, but the problem is, and it's a great problem to have, is that we have so many number one songs that it's hard to, or, well, well, we have 10 number one songs, but we have so many songs that even didn't go number one. They're like, yeah. you know, Cowboys Didn't Dance and all these uh, uh, Tequila Talkins one. It did not go number one, but it's right. one that people recognize. Trying to cram all those songs that we've had over the years into one show is kind of a problem. You know, we, so we had to do some medleys of like a couple of ballads that we had out on the radio that was like you lump them together into one song kind of thing, you know, kind of like a medley. Sure. Um, and we, of course, at the end of the show, we leave a little room to rock out, you know, so we leave the stage and we come back on and we do a rock medley of some kind. And that will change from year to year. We'll change that up. Nice. So the folks that are coming and paying that hard ticket, they are going to get a different um, a different take on things, maybe a mix of the different number ones and B-sides. Because like I said, I was on Spotify and it was like Lone Star's Greatest Hits. It's like, it's long. Right. You know what I mean? And you could hear yeah. you could hear in the in the beginning, you know, some of those really traditional early 90s rules, you know, um, flubby snare drum and a steel guitar super hot in the mix. Second verse, piano fills, right? And then things started right. changing a little bit. There's been a little bit more... Uh, <clears throat> piccolo snare drums and like the late 90s and then we get into early 2000s we have some of those lo-fi loops and stuff and and then um you know country seems like and and christian which is christian rock coming from nashville are, are kind of like nashville sonic diet is always kind of incorporating influences from the coasts and other styles so i can right, i can almost yeah. hear that evolution of the music over the 30-year period it's incredible yeah and and in the 90s um they were it was big into that that real tight piccolo snare totally in a room like with a room mic it's almost like they just well i know they mic'd all the drums and everything but they all have these room mics it's almost like it's like 60 percent room mic and 40 percent the rest of the snap of the the mics on the on the drums yeah but it was that big room sound and that big you know that big giant fat uh, i'm sorry thin 
you know, yeah. like big fat kick drum, but a Love thin, that. tight piccolo snare. Pop. Yeah. You know, we used to call it, Michael Britt used to call it um, uh, plywood. It sounds like plywood slapping together. It's like, you know. Yeah, it's like the, uh, in like, um, dum, 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 you know, like <laughs> that thing in the, uh, <laughs> right. the Christmas tune. Yeah. The, uh, I, I don't um, know what was it about that, but it, maybe it was easier to dance to or something. And of course, in the 80s, you had that big poofy snare, like on the Judds and Alabama. Which is, and stuff which is back sh- in a major way. It's back, yeah, right. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Now, what do you do to get that sound? Like, now, do you do you carry two snare drums live, or you may, maybe have something yeah. kind of tighter and then kind of something a little flubbier so, off to the? Yeah, exactly. I have. Well, um, I used to. We did one song. What's the song from um, from A Star Is Born? That that one that they. they oh got, yeah, yeah. They um, of the duet. I'm, yeah, um, I'm singing it in my head, but I'm yeah that one. I can't think of the name of it. Yeah. We did that for a while. That has the big poofy snare. So I used to actually when we did that song. I, Couple, right before COVID, a few years ago, I used to switch out snares during before that song, and I did that, and then I switched back for uh, front porch. But um, so what I do now is I have a side snare, little not a piccolo, but it's it's actually a tom that I converted. It's a twelve inch tom that I took from one of my Mapex kits, and I actually cut the bottom uh, snare rim to accept a twelve inch snare, and I ordered yeah. that off Amazon. Just a little twelve inch snare about that long, wired it up made it basically into a six lug little snare drum about that deep, you know, oh, deep, like to hear gutsy that. Sound. Yeah. Cause a lot of times, like you said, there's loops and things in, in our music and uh, you, it's hard to do that live to make it look convincing. So I have my little side snare so I can kind of emulate a little bit of a drum machine sound with that, that little tiny, yeah. small, thin sound and snare, and then go right back into the, the, the big snare, you know, the, which but then is you go, but then you tight. Yeah, and then you come in with the big snare, but then that loop feel goes away. You guys like right. that kind of works. I mean, there's so much that, that that I feel like so many of the acts in Nashville now are running like hundreds of tracks of shakers, tambourines, loops, backing vocals, soft synths, and it's like, come on, guys, this just doesn't sound like humans making music anymore. So I, that's cool that you yeah. guys are. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, I think the trick is to try and um, have a good sound man out front, a front of house guy that can incorporate that and make it sound natural and not not have all these things tambourines and uh, uh orchestra things that are out there that, that everybody's like, where's that symphony face. where the heck is that so yeah. do you guys have a long time crew that, that you can that you rely on like your front of house guys he's been with you a while or like 30 years yeah, a long time been. yeah we now of course through the years we have been through a, a lot of front of house guys because they you know will shut down for the year or something in a couple of months so they'll go get another gig or another tour sure. and um when the economy kind of tanked in 08, 07, 08, um, we went through a few then because we couldn't pay as much as we could. We had to downsize quite a bit back then. Yeah. We had two buses, three, three buses and two trucks at the time. And from 2002 to 2007, we had two, three buses and two trucks. We had a band bus, a crew bus, and a, what we call Amigos bus. We call them the Amigos because we used to have three guys on stage that we're just, um, you know, they're on stage playing, but they're not part of the, they don't own the band, you know, so right. like side guys, fiddle player, steel player. And I think we had an acoustic guy um, that would be on stage with us and play. So um, we didn't have enough room for them, I guess, on the artist bus. So we had the artist bus, which is us that own the band. And then um, we had a Amigos bus for the musicians, the other musicians. And then we had the crew bus for just the, you know, the lighting guy and the production manager and the, all that. Yeah. Stuff. But our tour manager did travel with us, you know, because, yeah. you know, I think that's important that the tour manager takes care of the guys, make sure they get their rooms and all that, make sure they're comfortable and all that. Totally. We get we get all that special treatment. Well, yeah, I mean, it does seem like it does seem like, uh, you know, the evolution of a band is you're in a van, then you're in a van and trailer, then you're in a bus, a bus and a trailer, and then maybe two buses, two trailers. You, then you make the leap to one semi. And you're like, why stop at one? Let's get three. And then before you know it, there's <laughs> seven. And then and then as things evolve, you're like, OK, we're going to run lean. I mean, we'll buy our own bus and then we don't need a semi. We'll do this thing. And, and you just make it all work. So the business model is constantly shifting and evolving. So it all makes sense because we we are running a business here. That's right. It's a business. You have to. Yeah, I think there's an, a certain amount of excess at some point that. If you have the money and the it's there, then yeah, why not have a a, a diesel rig with a gym in it, you know? And <laughs> yeah, totally. Like Tim McGraw has when he oh yeah, I remember not? that. If you can afford it, but then we had to cut down a little bit, um, and so we did. We went down to a bus, and and we just very 
conservatively, you know, okay, we just need enough crew members to fit the one bus, 12 bunks, anybody, if we have any more than 12 people, we don't have a place to put them, you know, so we kept it at 12 people. Um, so it was like six on stage and the rest all crew, including the driver had a, his bunk and we pulled a trailer and we've been doing that for ever since. And it's been worked out great. Fantastic. Yeah. I saw your bus you guys bought the other day. It's like, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to maintain something like that. And then, you know, you got to pay the driver and the fuel. It's a lot, you know, folks that just see you on stage, you know, playing that, uh, you know, that Enormo Dome, they don't know all the things that go into getting that many people there. And just behind the scenes, you know, the set builders, the carpenters, the video people, the front of house guys, then you, you might have somebody that's doing hospitality and setting up to make your rooms, you know, your vibe rooms cool. And then there's the chefs and there's a lot happening, you know? Yeah, it can be. It can be very undaunting to keep a track of all those people and all that stuff going on, you know, but if like, say, if you got the money and also the artist doesn't have to be plugged into that. He just hires a manager to take care of all that. Like I know that I met a person one time that their job was with Kenny Chesney was to set up the vibe room. That's right. They, that's their, they just, every day they would set up the tent. They would put the couches in there. They would set up the little bar, turn the lights on and the little tiki lamps or whatever, just so that Kenny Chesney could come and hang out and talk to his guys or whatever for a little bit. And then he would leave. Yeah. But, um, so because yeah, the biggest of part course, of being on the road is, is, as you're sleeping in a mobile bus, you're in a different zip code every night and it's not for the faint of heart because your luggage is always packed. And if you have any kind of a semblance of having any kind of normal life, which could involve uh, marriage and children, you're going to be gone so much. It's, yeah, so it's a, such a difficult thing. Yeah, I still live out of my suitcase even when I'm home. I mean, I just there's no there's no need to unpack ever. And then have to pack again, you know, so I love I to hear that place. Yeah, I have a little place in my bedroom where I have a thing where I can open like in a hotel room where I open my suitcase and I, I'll wash my clothes and I'll put them right back in the suitcase again, you know, for the next, you know, that way I can be gone. I don't have to worry about, oh, I got to get all my clothes together out of the drawers and closet and all this. I just keep everything neatly folded in my oh suitcase my and clean God. and all that and just head back out again. I thought I was a weirdo because literally the way I travel is I live out of a backpack. So people are like, what's that backpack is always with you. It's just, yeah, it's got my laptop. It's got my passport. It's got, uh, it's got my lactate uh, dairy digestive in it. It's got all of my hard drives. <laughs> I live out of that thing, right? My readers, any that's mobile. I am always on the go, whether I'm in Nashville, whether I'm on a bus, whether I'm on an airport that, and then, and then there's that exploding suitcase in the corner of my office that kind of gets repacked every time. And then there's our, that little hygiene bag, you know, that's got your, your deodorant and your toothpaste and everything. Yeah. I just, my bathroom, I just live out of that hygiene bag. And then do you do like, are you like me and you drop change and all kinds of stuff in there, you know, and like when oh, you're sure. in a hurry yeah. and take it out of your pockets. And so the other day I was staying in an Airbnb and I had my suitcase. I put it, folded it back up together and I forgot to zip it. And this isn't the first time this has happened. So oh I picked God. up the suitcase. I'm ready to go. And everything changed and cords and everything in my, this is the suitcase with my clothes, oh, yeah. my overnight bag, everything just went dumped right on the floor. I, it took me 30 minutes to pick up all the change and all the receipts oh, and all the stuff that I had just thrown in there, you know? So my question to you is how often do you, like this backpack you're talking about yeah. has your, all your stuff in it, you know, your computer and everything. How often do you go in and completely take everything out and have to repack it? Because once a week, kind of, crazy yeah once a week you're like yeah. well i don't need that once many ears like i need like i got three set i'm such a boy scout so like even if i go to like you know do a corporate speech or go sit in with some other band or do, i've always got at least two sets of ears right and then you got a set of headphones right. and then you know it's it's just it's your lit you're on the go we are All the chargers that you have to have for your oh phone God. and your gopro and your yeah. uh, watch and everything oh. it's crazy i yeah. i I'm so bad at trying to stay organized with that stuff. Yeah. Some people just don't, they just would never be down with that. They're just like, no, I like working at my home studio. I like working at music row. Maybe I'll play down a lower Broadway. Maybe I'll go out for the weekend with some of people, but being road dogs like us for the amount of time. I mean, like I was saying, yeah. I've been playing with Al Dean for um, 23 years. That's a long time. That's five really? presidencies. Years. Wow. Yeah. I, I met a young Jason Aldean and the guys in the band in 1999 when I was playing with Pam Tillis. So Pam Tillis was kind of like my cool first time I had a salary, first time I had a, a drum tech. And that while I was doing that, we were kind of building, you know, uh, Jason's, you know, doing showcases and stuff. So 
fun, similar story, man. So what is your favorite? Do you have a couple of favorite songs you like to play? And was there like a famous uh, in your mind, a favorite era of Lone Star? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I think they both go in hand in hand. I think Great. my favorite song to play is Amazed. OK, because and it's even even though it's a simple ballad, you know, like one and three and, you know, just kind of very simple drum beat. Um, just making that sound like the studio and, and seeing what it meant to people every time we play that and seeing the reaction that the crowd gives when we play Amazed, that keeps me going. That's enough to, I don't ever get bored with that song. I never think like, oh, I got to play Amazed again. Awesome. It's more like, okay, I'm going to make it sound even more like the record tonight. And I have that sort of challenge myself type thing, you know? Yeah. And, and, and you asked me what my favorite era was and that right around the early 2000s, 1999, 2000, 2001, that was a huge time for me because that got me uh, because we were making more money then and we could, you know, do a big concerts and all this. I invested it's something I was interested in. I was interested in cinematography yes. when I was in the eighties and I shot a lot of super eight and things like that. And my dad used to do that when I was a kid, he worked at um, like a advertising agency doing commercials and stuff like that. I was too young to realize any of the film stuff, but I do remember him editing in my room. My room was his editing suite. Wow. Maybe that had something to do with my fascination with it or something. But um, so in 19, not in, in the year 2000, I took some money and instead of buying like a sports car or something, I invested about 50 grand into a really good film camera, you know, that you use to shoot music videos and documentaries and commercials. And that was kind of the, the big thing at that time, that 16 millimeter, really good camera package. That's what the, it was the workhorse of the industry at the time. Right. And I wanted one. I, I didn't go to film school or anything. That was my film school. So you just kind of just got into and that was kind of like pre YouTube. So you were just kind of devouring like books and uh, just getting information. And so the, that that grew into you now directing pretty regularly music videos, yeah. artists, EPKs. I remember working one time at uh, Oceanway Studio and you were there filming. Um, I believe it was an EPK for an artist. And I was like, it was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was Absolutely. fun. Absolutely. And I was, of course, you're so animated the way you play and everything. I think I was filming you more than anybody else because they're like, hey, so cool. th this is the girl that's paying you over here. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> and everybody else is just kind of, yeah, you know, and you're like, <laughs> anyway, oh so, my God. Uh, yeah, so I got into that. I got, I was really into it. Now, before I bought my film camera, I already had read books on cinematography and I knew, and I shot a lot of Super 8 and I'd already sort of almost like the equivalent of going to film school. You know, I sort of learned all, everything I needed to know. And especially enough to know what kind of camera I needed or I wanted, you know, the kind that everybody uses on the higher level, you know, like sure. music videos and stuff. The kind that you rent when you shoot a music video back then, you would rent it for like $3,000 a day, you know, for the whole, the lenses and the, the camera and the magazines and the batteries and the whole kit. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to own mine, you know, I wanted to own my own. Smart. So I invested in that. And so I shot a video for Lone Star. I'd been shooting stuff out on the road with us because, you know, I would bring the camera out on the road with us, put it in a junk bunk, and then I would take it out during sound check. And when we're all in the studio and just all the time, I would be filming and just transferring the film, paying for the film out of my own pocket and just learning. And I thought someday... Well, I'll be glad that I filmed this stuff, you know, because when I was in Canyon, I shot a bunch of Super 8 film and I thought I was the only one doing that in the band. Nobody else documented our journey, you know. Yeah. And um, I remember doing that for Lone Star and then it ended up being a video for With Me, the song With Me. And then I was talking to Jam Jamie O'Neill one day and she had seen the Lone Star video and she said, hey, that's really cool that you shot all that stuff, didn't you? And I said, yeah. And I was kind of giving her advice about how to you should have somebody in your band with a really good camera, like a 16 millimeter camera that, Oh, you know, 20 years, 30 years from now, you'll be looking at this stuff going, Oh man, I'm so glad we shot that. And so she said, well, we have a video camera. And I said, no, not a video camera, a film camera. And she said, well, what's the difference? And I was, so I said, I can't explain it to you, but let me bring my camera and I'll shoot you guys and I'll transfer the film. I'll show you myself. And then if you want to use it in a video or a documentary sometime, you can so I shot um, a whole roll of film on her while she was out on tour with us, Jamie O'Neill. And um, I edited it down with my little Final Cut Pro. I edited it down into one of her songs and showed it to her. 
And she went nuts when she awesome. saw how good that film looked and everything that, that wide angle lenses and, and, and how amazing it looked like a real video, you know, yeah. and instead of like a home camcorder or something yeah, like that. that a Sony, like yeah. A, yeah. A Sony thousand dollar job. Yeah. It looks like CMT had come out and shot this whole, you know, concert or something. And it was all her and her crew and stuff during sound check and just like little things. But I edited it down into her song and she went, this is our next video. She goes, can you just continue? What would it cost to get you to continue to keep shooting and that kind of thing? So I talked to her label and they said, well, we'll just treat it like a normal music video and we'll pay you to continue on and shoot it and edit it and all that. And we'll service it to CMT. So that's how I got that Jamie. That's on awesome. Video. That well, was, I mean, that kind of got me started. Uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's, there was a period there where a lot of music videos were, and it may have changed, but we're talking maybe budgets of 80 grand or something or so, or, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, that was like, I feel like 10 years ago, that was a, a, a budget. And now things, I think feel like things have changed. Like there's a lot of high level artists that are still doing videos. I don't know if the return on investment is, is, is as strong because there's more right. less places for people to see music videos, but it sure is a cool thing. Like with, you know, guys our age, you know, who grew up on MTV and JJ Jackson and Martha Quinn and Nina Blackwood, like we loved watching music videos. So right. if somebody, if there's an up and coming artist or an established artist that uh, is here in Nashville that wants your services, pretty easy to get a hold of. Keach, how do they get in touch with you? I would go on Facebook and just type in my name, Keach Rainwater, and then you can contact me through that if you need I to. I love it. Okay. Keep um, it personal like that. Yeah. I love yeah. that. And now, the, I get little messages like that all the time that say, hey, hey, we got this much budget. And what would you think about doing a video? You seem like the guy that would be the one to do it. I love that. Yeah, man. Um, not afraid to roll up your sleeves and get get busy, get dirty, get those hands dirty, man. Uh, who are some of your filmmakers that you really, really admire? Like for me, like oh, I love Ridley Scott. Like, I mean, for whatever reason, there's something, it never fails to give me an emotional response, but 1978, Sigourney Weaver, Alien. I mean, I can watch it yeah. over and over and see something different every time and be inspired in a different way and be scared in a different way. Just the lighting and the, the claustrophobia. And you could tell that the actors mm -hmm. were not informed about a lot of things. They were thrown into the deep right. end. Of the, it's a masterpiece. And to think that, that he Absolutely. would go on after that and keep making masterpieces. Yeah, I remember seeing something about Alien where the actors were in there and just kind of they said, just keep going, keep going. Well, we're not going to tell you when we're recording or not. And they wouldn't tell them. And they were they didn't even know what to say or do. They were just kind of just act like a crew, just for talk amongst yourselves, whatever. And then to know later what that was going to look like in the movie, have that sort of natural, yep. uh, you know, hey, we're just having dinner on the crew of this spaceship or whatever, you know, and um yeah. And also the fact that they didn't know what was going on kind of informed the look and what was, you know, their emotions. And stuff. Yeah. yeah. I really don't know how they kept the chest burster scene a secret because you could see that that one actress, Veronica Cartwright, she was not ready for that. Yeah. Right. You know, just she was mortified when she saw that. Yeah. She's covered in blood. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable. And her voice in that wasn't dubbed. That was her actual like, oh, my God. You know, like that, that sort of grossed out weird. I love it that yeah. you're into it as I am. Um, so yeah. who, who are some guys that, that like inspire George, you to this day? Yeah. George Lucas is probably my favorite because, sure. um, you know, he started out um, in that sort of renegade kind of like filmmakers that he, he always went further than he was expected to, you know, that kind of thing. And hearing his story about how, uh, you know, he started out in Star Wars and he's just kind of stuck with it and he keep making that movie and believed in it and believed in it. When most people would just go, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. You know, he just kind of to the point where he had hypertension and he had to go to the hospital and people were coming down on him. And then you see the movie Star Wars and people are like, oh, man, I totally get it. What he was yeah. trying to do, you know. Because like just, those actors, they didn't see all the spaceships and special effects and all that. They didn't know anything about that. That they were doing some kids' movie. Yeah, they had to they had to use their imagination and just all those miniature, the miniature stuff really still holds up. And things like mm -hmm. the sand people, you know, that's just paper mache. And then the banthas are like right. elephants covered in that stuff. And know. you know, Greedo, a spacesuit, and then of course the music was so incredible. Who's another yeah. guy that I just, oh, uh, Spielberg is, is the Jaws guy. And yeah. mm -hmm. everyone was so de deflated and depleted on that set because the mechanical the shark, shark never worked. <laughs> never worked. So they showed it 
so much less than they wanted to, which created right, more yeah. tension and uncertainty. Exactly. And yeah. More mystery to it. Yeah. Did yeah. you ever hear the interview with um, uh, with uh, the, the what's his name? Um, they played the the main character, not not the sheriff, but oh, um, uh, uh, it's not Roy Scheider, but the other guy. No. Yeah, that was in guy, Close yeah. Encounters. Um, yeah, right. I'm yeah. thinking of his name all of a sudden, but um, he was saying when they interviewed him, um, he, Richard Dreyfus. Richard um, Dreyfus. He was saying the whole experience of Jaws is just waiting and waiting, and that's that. And he hears the walkie-talkie. It's like the shark isn't working. The shark's not working. The shark for days, and all of a sudden, one time, it was like the shark is working, <laughs> and they were all like, "Oh, what?" <laughs> Places, <laughs> and everyone. Was, yeah, and Steven Spielberg was saying that every single time they would go to do a shot. It would be perfect. And then a, a sailboat would drift right behind them and they would lose the shot. Cut. And then they would wait for the sailboat to go by and they would say, OK, we're ready to roll again. And then, but the lighting boat, the boat with all the lights on it, had drifted further away and it weren't, didn't have their light all stopped. So it was constant, that constantly having yeah. a battle with that. I'd like to know who what the actress movie. was that uh, was was swimming. Um uh, nude, Naked, nude in the, and yeah. she was by the dinghy and just her death and the way she was being dragged around and pulled under and it was so ridiculously realistic i wonder if she's still yeah. alive and she, if she uh, went i saw an interview with her one time where she talked about the experience and all that and yeah you know she said it was it was really cool and she had no idea how impactful that was going to be you know she yeah. just kind of did her thing and you know Totally. But yeah, filmmakers like that and um, J.J. Abrams and oh, come on, uh, yeah. all this. Yeah, uh, yeah. John Favreau, people like that really inspire me. You know, oh, someday yeah, he, I would like to do a movie. But right yeah. now with the touring and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Favreau, I mean, of course, went in, uh, you know, on to do the Spider-Man's and do um, the Mandalorian and conceive the Mandalorian. He was like he writes and directs and acts and a lot of things that he does. And he had this killer movie with uh, John Leguizamo, say that really fast, um, called Chef. It was about a, yeah, a, that's a, a one like, of my favorite a, movies. Yeah, I, I, you, you and I are got the same taste. Uh, a, a Michelin yeah. starred chef who's crumbling under the pressure of being a Michelin top rated chef and having to always recreate himself versus, you know, to be super artistic or give the people what they want, which is hamburgers and fries yeah, and, and caught up. He's caught up in the toxicity of social media yep. and has no idea what it's all about and learns the hard way. And so has to kind of start over, you know? Yeah. And then he go it's and they wild. create a, a food truck and he becomes ridiculously happy. And he, they, he, what is it? He's there every Tuesday and Abbott Kenny or like, I used to walk that neighborhood all the time and people were just blown away by his fresh culinary ideas on a food. I love food truck culture. I, I don't think we have enough here in Nashville. I, I hope it explodes a little bit more. Yeah, I think the problem, I was actually going to have a food truck one time. I was like an investment thing. I found a food truck for sale and a friend of mine that was a chef said she was interested in doing some kind of food truck thing. And I was like, I'll buy the truck and you run it and do all the stuff. And we, I think we we're going to do like breakfast burritos on Broadway or something like that. Mm. So at night, all the people out of the clubs can go and all the drunk people can come out and, oh, look at that. It's, it's breakfast burritos. Um, but I ran into all kinds of problems with um, you can't sell. You, you can't be within 200 feet of a restaurant. And you, there was all these ordinances mm. that said you couldn't do it. And when you go down there and see at that time, this was in uh, like 09, uh, 2010, um, you'd see all these food trucks down there. But it turns out that they were kind of grandfathered in and knew the owner of that parking lot or something. and got special permission to, to park it there and that kind of thing. So I, I decided not to do it. Yeah, man. Well, uh, so when you make that film, you know, remember, I could be doorman number three or detective number two. That'd be fun. I've always thought about you when I thought about making a film. I thought, well, what actors do I know? I don't really know a lot of actors. And I thought, well, I know Rich Redmond. I know. I know. Definitely know a lot of local actors here of all, all shapes and sizes and, and, and ages because we took classes together and just kind of jumped into the deep end of the pool. That was kind of like a, a fun kind of like midlife thing that I've been into. And you were telling me during the pandemic, you discovered... Um, 3D printing. I do. What is so that? Right there, I, I just don't that, understand that. Right that. There is one of my. See that where I'm pointing at? That's yeah. one of my 3D printers there. And the, where you can't see right over there, there's I actually have two more 3D. I have three total 3D printers: a resin one that prints like uh, with the liquid resin, and then two filament printers that was like a, you know, best way I could describe it is like a hot glue gun um, with a robot arm and a hot glue gun. So with the that a robot squeezing out the hot glue. But I get that every I get that these devices can create just about anything. But 
but how? What's what do you how do you front load it? How do you create it? What's the blueprint? What do you do? Right. So uh, when COVID started, right about when COVID started, we had to get off the road. And I had a friend who taught 3D printing at the Nashville Public Library. And um, he was telling me that he had just got this new 3D printer. It was real cheap and you should get one. And, and I was like, yeah, I had one a while back, but I didn't know how to use it. He goes, dude, I'll show you how to use it. So he got me hooked up with um, Fusion 360, which is a, you know, like a Alien, um, what is it? Um, Autodesk program. Um, you pay the subscription, kind of like um, it's kind of like for 3D design. It's sort of like Photoshop for 3D design. Gotcha. And then he showed me how to draw shape, extrude it, soften the edges, make it hollow. You know, just basic commands to make a basic shape. And then I started from there and started designing uh, these. Did I basically designed some uh, Star Wars details for my one wheel. You know, I ride the one wheel which is like a skateboard kind of thing. Wow. Like a unicycle. Uh, no, it's, uh, it's like, a imagine a, um, a, a snowboard with a wheel attached right in the middle of it. Oh that, yeah. It has a computer that balances it. So a shorter than a shorter than a snowboard, a little bit bigger than a skateboard. And it has its own battery power and you step on it and it holds you flat. And then you lean forward to go forward. It activates that wheel. And it's the coolest thing ever. It's just like magic. It's like a it magic. Sounds dangerous. Of- it's, it sounds like, you know, you could break your wrists. You could. I know a lot of people have like wrist guards and a helmet and all that stuff. And I did all that. The first I've had it for four years now. The first year I or six or eight months to a year, I wore a helmet and did all that stuff. And uh, I just never fell. I just I got really good at it. I was really careful. I don't go too fast on it. I'm kind of act my age on there. You know, I don't try to go for speed records and I'll try to jump and I don't do tricks or anything like that. I just like to go like to downtown Nashville, which I'm going to do later today. Meet a friend down in downtown Nashville. We park, we get our one wheels out and you can ride for like 20 miles on a single battery charge. So we ride all over downtown and up and down Broadway. And on the cool thing is you can get on the street and go with the cars as long as they're not going too fast and then pop over on the sidewalk, go up an alley and handicap ramp, pick it up, carry it into a Starbucks, whatever, recharge if you want to. It's so light and, but so mobile, you know, that's it's great. Amazing. And it's, I, yeah. I feel, I feel it's like, it's a, uh, it's very underground. Uh, it's very forward thinking. I don't see a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Um, they're made out of California. They're about, I, I think the newest models about, uh, you can get one for about a couple thousand dollars, like 20, 2100 or 1800 yeah, yeah. or something like that. Anyway, um, about the same price as I guess you would pay for a decent mountain bike or something, you know, yeah. I, I think. Um, but yeah, they're, they're super great. You charge them um, in a regular wall plug, you know, you charge it for a couple wow. hours and you get a wow. full charge, you get on there and just go. And I just went on a group ride in Denver. I was in Denver visiting some family and I hooked up with this Facebook group of one wheel riders. There's but 20, there's 22 of them. And we all met in downtown Denver and got on our one wheels and rode for about two hours, just all just like a gang of, of one. Look like we're all surfing. Oh, my God. And it was at night and it was really cool. I mean, just riding all around downtown Denver. It was really fun. I like doing those group rides. That's awesome, man. So filmmaking, the one wheeler, 3D printing, very involved with the band. The band is still super active. Um, do you guys like have a an exit strategy or are you just kind of do going to ride into the sunset till the wheels fall off, man? That's it. Yeah, we're going to we're going to play together as a band as long as we are able. As long as we can still get up on stage even if they have to wheel us up there, we're still that's doing right. it. I think I that's it. the way everybody feels. Yeah, I haven't heard anything from anybody that says like, oh, you know, how long are we going to do this? Or, or I got a couple years left in me and then I'm going to retire. Nothing like that. It's all let's just keep going. You know, yeah, I don't doing. think musicians as long as we retire. got an audience. Yeah. As yeah. long as people want to hear Lone Star songs, we we will play. Them. Awesome. Come out and do them. That's great to hear that. I feel like the country genre is so it's so loyal. I mean, the, the, the you know, the folks that are listening to like the Dua Lipas of the world, you know, and it's like, you know, maybe she'll get 10 years. You know what I mean? If she's like super, super lucky. But I, it just feels like in our genre that, that people will go their entire life in all the seasons of their life and remain a fan. It's a pretty incredible thing. Yeah. And, and now that at our age, we've kind of become the, um, I don't the, know, like the teachers, you know, like, huh? You're like an OG. O- OG? Like the original gangster. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Yo, um, OG. we've kind of become the senior class, you know, so people come to us uh, for advice on 
things about career stuff and publishing and kind of that. We've just been in it so long and doing it yeah. so long. We've kind of become the, you know, you're, you're the same, yeah. um, the sort of the professors of the yeah. country thing. Like, how do you do this? And what was it like back yeah. then? And how do you do it now? And all that, which uh, you asked earlier, how 90s Nashville has compared to today. Sure. And I think the biggest I think the biggest change is with social media because before in order to get a song out and to, so people knew who you were, you had to have the record label and you had to have the promotions department. You had to have country radio without and CMT. All that was the machine. Yes. Nowadays, it's a whole nother machine. It's like a spaceship. It's like, a whole, you know, you can just get out there and on social media alone, you get all these uh, streams and, um, what do you call it? Uh, subscribers and all that sure. stuff. And then that's can almost warrant you a record deal. If you yeah. even need a record deal, you know, you could still, if you're famous enough, promoters can book you and they go, Oh yeah, he's huge on Spotify or he's huge on uh TikTok or something like that. And we opened up for a guy recently that was a huge TikTok or Spotify or something like that. One of those social media things, um, huge, big into Instagram and all that. It had millions and millions of views or, you know, streams or whatever. And we opened up for him. He was that big, you know, wow. especially in the area that he was in, wow. which I think was like the Northeast or something. Um, country artists got out their plate and it was a huge crowd. They were like, woo, woo, you know, and we opened up for them. And I'm thinking like, why are we opening for somebody that's just like <laughs> popular on Spotify or something? But it, yeah. you could see why when you saw the crowd. Yeah, the machinery is changing. I, I still feel like in this genre, the terrestrial radio is still fairly pow powerful. You know, and thank yeah, God I for the, so. you know, the songwriters have been, you know, they're complaining, you know, like, you know, a lot of folks, how Spotify changed things and streaming and, and the songwriters are making so, so much less and fractions of a penny. But when the song, if the song is a single for, on terrestrial radio, you can still make buku bucks, which is great. For them. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I think there's still people still listen to it in their car, but I think times are changing as we keep moving. And it's more like satellite radio and stuff like that. So luckily that the, the radio companies that do the radio are evolving just like we have, you know, yeah. and they're getting more into like syndicated things and everybody's got to survive. Right. So everybody totally. figures out a way to keep their machine rolling somehow, you know, to go with the times and yeah. We're all figuring it out together. Totally. I mean, so, 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 Keats, you feel like the you and or the band have a book in you? Is there a book in you telling your, telling your story? That's funny. I have thought about that forever because I listen to a lot of audio books. When I'm, my daughter, she's Canadian, so I drive up and back and forth to Canada a lot. Yeah. And I always choose an audio book to listen to on the way up and an audio book to listen to the way on the way down. I like to choose a lot of um, autobiography from musicians and rock people, you know, and stuff like that. Um, sure. Also, I like true crime, a lot of true crime stuff. I'm really interested in that. Um, uh, I always thought listening to those audio books that, you know, I think somebody, there's an audience for Lone, for Lone Star fans or for country fans to hear like how the whole Lone Star journey started and how it, um, and I think Dean, our keyboard player, the founding member of Lone Star should be the one to write it for sure. That's fantastic. Yeah, man. Or yeah, just kind of like write it together. You can you can get a ghostwriter or you can get, you know, uh, Lone Star with and then you, you know, you're letting yeah. the world know that, hey, we got somebody kind of helping us with this because we haven't read a, yeah. written a book before. Um, I think that's a great idea. And then you are very involved in new media in the sense that you have a podcast called Designated Drummer. And what was yeah. the input? What was the impetus of that? And are, are you are you enjoying that or are people digging it? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. It's growing like anything else. I've been doing it for over a year now. And yeah. it started out with my girlfriend who is um, who took a class on how to design a digital learning platform. Like if somebody's a yoga instructor and they want to have an online, this is when COVID hit and stuff, they want to have an online business where they teach people how to do yoga or they teach people how to dance or they teach people how to play the guitar, whatever. Um, and she took a course on, it was like a, I think it was like a $2,000 course on how sure. to do that, how to promote it, how to best way to record it, how to just how to do all that. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that you had to do was have a podcast. And my girlfriend thought that I should have a learning platform about how to become a professional drummer sure. because I have been in the industry for 40 years and things that, that, that we didn't know back then we had to learn the hard way, you know, just like you. Oh, yeah. um, we didn't know everything when we started out. We didn't know that you're supposed to have road cases for your drums when you hit the road. Yeah. And then when you got your first gig, you're like, uh, okay, just bring your cases. And you're like, cases? What? 
I just yeah. put them in my car. Right? So <laughs> things like that, that you learn along the way, you know, how to get past an audition, how to, um, the, the right things to practice of playing with the click. Yep. A lot of people didn't know you were going to have to play with a click in sure. your career. So we had yeah. to learn the hard way, things like that. So I was trying to design a course about that, about how to become a professional drummer. Go, sort of my idea was go from the garage to the big stage, uh, moving you from the garage band player to the big stage and a touring band and all the things you need to know. So uh, one of the things that came up was do a podcast and um, get people to recognize you as the go-to person for whatever it is, your expert. Yeah. Yeah. So I started the podcast. I haven't done the course yet because we're still trying to work all that out, you know, Um, but I thought I would do the podcast for a little while and let that run its course and keep maybe get some, you know, a lot of subscribers or something like that. Sure. So I just kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it. And I've learned so much. And I thought it was just going to be drummers in the beginning, but I, you know, thought about, well, you know, they, people that want to be a professional musician, they would need to know things about publishing and about uh, law, you know, a little bit of law or booking or um, about like a studio engineer. I had a studio engineer, Mills Logan, you know, who sure. Mills Logan is. Totally. He has Mills Logan has the most uh, downloads of any of my podcast um, guests. Nice. A lot of engineers moving to Nashville. Uh, yeah, they're coming here from New York and LA. Yeah. They're coming here from colleges. They're graduating. They're like, where, where can I work? Where can I still uh, buy dirt and afford a house yeah, and, right. and, and have a exactly, community? Yeah. You know, but you're and definitely so Mills Logan. Yeah, you're definitely great for yeah, that. He man, was, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. So the name designated drummer came from. When we're out on the road and we are getting ready to go on stage, some of the guys will do a little toast. They'll have a little little drink before the show just to sure. kind of loosen up a little bit. Now, I can't do that because I have to operate uh, the, you know, the uh, I operate all the video screens and all that stuff around. It's kind of like a one man band back there operating all this stuff, hitting the foot switch to start the, the click track and some things yeah. like that. I have to be on the game. I have to start your the game. songs and all that. I cannot be outside of my headspace. Sure. Maybe until after the show. I so you wait till after. Or yeah. Something like that. Sure. Yeah. So I, and they'll say something like, Hey, well, aren't you going to have a toast with us? And I'm like, no, I'm the designated drummer, kind of like designated driver. Yes. So I use that term a lot. I'm the designated drummer. So then that, when I thought about doing a podcast, that name just popped in my head, you know, that's awesome. Well, yeah. you're also a designated yeah. survivor. Um, but tell us about the running the video from back there. Usually that's a front of house task, you know, where you're syncing yeah. empty code with the click and you know, all that. So what do you have like a little, yeah. like an SPDSX that's like trigger firing off video uh, chapters? Yeah, exactly. Or- um, because you know how it is when you're live, the singer or whoever's talking to the audience will talk a little ways, and then w- you get the cue like, okay, when they say those words, I have to start the song. You know, like just before I would actually start the song off, and they say, and the song, da 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 da. They'll talk for a little bit, and then they'll cue. they I'll have to cue the music. So since I'm the one starting the songs, I'm the one with the foot switch that, that does that. Right. Whereas if it were somebody else doing it from off stage, they might not hit it at the right time. They may come in too early, or they may they yeah. may there would be too much dead time when they're done talk. So I, I have to time it just right. So um, I have, we have a system that goes through a computer. Basically I have an iPad that has all the songs listed on there. I can actually mm-hmm. touch them. If we decide to skip the order of songs and we're going to skip two songs or do one before the other one, I can actually touch it on the iPad and hit the foot switch and it'll start nice. that song. And that'll have click track and video and all that stuff, we got these video screens, LED screens that kind of coincide with the show and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I have to operate all that stuff from where I'm at with a foot switch. That's incredible. So, yeah. so you're actually incorporating some of your cinematography, you know, director stuff back there behind the drums. I wish I wish I had more to do with. I wish I could say that I had to do more with the filming of all the content on there. But that's actually yeah. Dean, our keyboard player. He he edits and comes up because all that stuff is real technical. It has to be a certain shape. The screens are like, oh. some are this shape and some are long and thin. It all has to be, it's very technical. So yeah. we have a guy that helps us with that. And Dean will go and put together all the content and that kind of stuff. So, you yeah. know, it's a lot of work and kudos to him for doing it because he is the one that sort of championed the whole video screens. And also there's some moving lights that it controls. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> and also our lead singer has a, uh, just, you know, for some of the lengthier songs, like no news and stuff, he has a teleprompter down there. Yeah. So that program actually runs the teleprompter too. So it's always in sync with the song. And Oh my so, God. Yeah. yeah that, that's great. So that's the system. Yeah. Some acts can use a teleprompter. It's, it's literally some people are, they, they literally, they get lost like a deer in the headlight. They just stare at it. 
you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but it yeah. could be, it could be a, uh, you know, a good thing for the, for the aging brain. So yeah, Drew Womack, yeah. great front man. I loved that band sons of the desert, man. And it's all kind yeah. of full circle. Now you got him in the band and Richie went to do the front men with Tim Rushlow. Yeah. And who is the other, uh, uh, uh it's uh, Larry Stewart from yeah, Larry uh, Stewart's heart. And they're doing yeah. really, really well. Of course, you know, I was in a band with, uh, Tim Rushlow. And when, when you guys were having your big, big success, in the early 2000s, you guys would be playing at nine o'clock at night and we would be playing at nine in the morning. Uh, that was a, that, that was a different time and schlepping my own drums there and oh, schlepping God. a mini disc player around. And and man, those mini discs, um, I also used one with Pam Tillis and, you know, she would be talking to the audience. And when she would say some specific thing, I would have to hit start on the mini disc player and it would be tracks that like say Lonnie or Paul or Chad Cromwell had recorded and counted off the song. And it seemed like an eternity. It would be like one, two, oh, what? That just seemed like it. Yeah, if you right. didn't hit it r soon enough, it just that There's dead, all this time, dead time. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, it the, felt audience, the audience doesn't hear that. They, yeah. they just hear not, crickets, you know, until yeah. you actually come in. Yeah. It just so, uh, felt what like I an eternity. Do is, to, for me, I actually will, because I'll know where the count is in there. We have some long counts that are like that. Yeah. I count it loud, like, like so the audience can hear me over all the drum mics. It sounds like I'm counting it off. So it's not dead time. Yeah. It's more like, so I'll go one, two, one, two. So the audience just thinks I'm counting the band in, Smart. you know, when yeah. actually, you know, it's, yeah. Totally. Totally. Like if you just sit there and do nothing, then it'll just be dead time up until somebody hits a note, you know? Yeah. So. Well, I, you know, me personally, I, I feel like you looking back on 40 years as a professional drummer, 30 years with the same band. Um, if you were just to every time you're inspired about or or something comes to your mind about the rules and regulations of being gainfully employed and surviving the music business as a drummer and all the changes and all the growing and changing and evolving you've had to do. You just write this grand list down of everything that comes to mind. Something as little as like living out of a suitcase and what to pet, what to have on the road and how to be a boy scout and be prepared and not get caught with your pants down and, and uh, when to eat catering, don't do it 30 minutes before you play like all these rules. That'd be a very successful program or book. Yeah, yeah. And so when my course, when I do get it together and it does come out, it'll, it'll uh, be like, um, it'll be a 30 day course or something like that. Like I think six weeks, maybe. Yeah. And then a couple of things a week that'll talk about things. Yeah, like playing to a click track, what to expect in the studio, because a lot of drummers don't know that they don't yeah. know what to expect if they've never played in the studio before. Yeah. And how daunting that can be and all the things that go on in your mind while you have to listen to the click, you have to be able to read a chart, yeah. you have to be cool and play cool licks, but not too much, you know, just keep it neat and potato, you know, all that yeah. stuff that you have to know and uh, also touring you know all those things that we never knew that how to conduct a proper sound check a lot of people don't know that it starts out with a kick drum and then you start with the snare and this whatever the sound man needs and you build from there and you may jam a little bit get that then you play your own songs and just how to conduct a a successful kind hearted sound check that's not like gonna that. make anybody mad you know oh that's right there's a yeah, there's a technique and there's unspoken rules about all that kind of stuff um I, I i love the idea that it would be like six weeks and you would guide them through the process and they would be accountable maybe there would be some testing and stuff i have a training program it's like nearly six hours 120 videos it's called drumming in the modern world.com and it's on kajabi now there's other kind of training sites like udemy and uh, there's all sorts of other like training sites yeah. where you can learn just anything underwater basket re weaving photography pole dancing uh, speed reading you know whatever um but mine is just out there and people pay 99 bucks one time and they have it for their entire life and they can consume it at will so that's kind of like you know my program and it's Great just kind of yeah kind of this there forever but i like your idea of guiding people through the process and you get doing little mini tests and things like that to keep people yeah. accountable and make sure that the information yeah. is absorbed it's a great idea. And it's assuming that it's assuming that this person, the ex, um, what my, what I call my ideal customer avatar, ICA would already be a good drummer. Let's right. just say, you know, somebody that's out of high school, they could play drums. They're a good drummer, not beginners. It's not for the beginner drummer, because obviously a beginner drummer, you go to a, on an audition, they're going to tell that you're a beginner drummer, but yeah. you know, to have somebody that really knows how to play, but just doesn't know how to go about 
f- getting from the garage to the big stage? You know, how yes. do I get how do I get to be that guy that everybody knows or that everybody wants in their band? Yeah, because I really do feel like a lot of the, the you know, the younger guard, this new generation of kids, let's say 18 to 26, they're moving to Nashville and they're very familiar with Pro Tools. They're very familiar with loops. They're very familiar with firing off Ableton from an SPDSX, hybrid drumming, incorporating pads, all the stuff, playing with clicks, their favorite in-ear models. They, they are, have embraced technology in a major way. Yeah. But just some of that stuff that you're talking about, how to get from Berkeley to the big stage or the basement to the big stage, whatever it is, you know, yeah. some of these unspoken rules. And one of the things that I feel like is missing is literally their motivation. They're just like, well, I've done all this stuff. I, I'm, you know, I'm paying back my student loans, quarter million dollars to Berkeley, and I am ready to do this. I don't necessarily want to go down to lower Broadway and learn learn these country standards and play for tips and or yeah, you know, I just feel like there's a little bit of a they much like social media they want it now they want it mm-hmm. now they want it fast they want a fast lane to to yeah. be in the big band you know the, yeah and the you just stage. can't be in in a rush you got to enjoy the process enjoy the journey enjoy every step of the way and celebrate all those victories. Yeah. So I think you're onto something there, man. And, you know, I just, I really enjoyed this time together. I thought we were like long overdue um, and congratulations on 40 years as a professional drummer. Congratulations coming up on 30 years with Lone Star, an amazing body of work and uh, the podcast designated drummer. And if somebody wants to find you, Facebook is your platform of choice. Yeah. For things like, you know, like you said, if someone wants a video shot or something like that, you know, just, um, I try not to do a lot. Like I don't have any business cards printed or anything like that for music videos. It just, I just take what comes along because I don't have to make a living doing that, but I do enjoy when someone has a little bit of a budget and they can come along and say, Hey, here's the song. What can you do for it? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Once every couple months or so I'll do a video. I used to be a lot more busy, but when I had my daughter and she was growing up, I decided I made a conscious effort not to be just working all the time and miss, miss her growing up. Oh, man. Good job. Good job balancing yeah. all that stuff, man. Awesome. Well, um, hey, I was going to ask you, Rainwater, is there some Native American in you there? I used to think so, but my sister recently did a one of those genealogy searches. Yeah. And she amazingly found that there really wasn't any um, Native American. I mean, there has to be, right, with a name like Rainwater. But when she did the genealogy search, there was, it wasn't much in the way of like, you know, I'm the, a quarter Cherokee or something like that. You know, it really wasn't much at all. But what I heard was that it was a little bit of Creek Indian, Creek, huh. Creek Indian. So what is the uh, rest? What's the rest of your makeup? Uh, um, oh, um, I can't remember. It was like some um, German in there, I want to say. I could see that. Which explains yeah. the blonde hair, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. if I'm Native American and have blonde hair, that just doesn't, that's not right. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think there's some German in there. So I don't know. Um, I don't remember all the rest of the other mix that was in there, but I do remember there was just a little bit of Native American, but not much. Yeah, man. Oh, my God. It was such a pleasure to catch up with you, man, in a public forum. You know, good luck for the say hi to the guys for me. Robbie Wilson on bass. Big fan. Love that guy. I haven't seen him in a long, long, long time. And uh, everyone uh, check out Lone Star's body of work on the Spotify or on the uh, Apple Music. And to all the listeners out there, we really appreciate you guys. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. Keep coming back for the good stuff. We definitely appreciate it. We'll see you next time. Keach, thanks so much, man. Thank you. See ya. See ya, Rich. All right, brother. This has been the Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com forward slash podcasts.